we're going to talk about the history of computing. Um, I find it really fascinating that computers have become such a major part of our daily lives and in every way possible. I mean, almost everything we do is relying upon a computer. And yet, in most um, survey courses of American history or world history, there's very little mention given to the, um, the technological innovations and the background history that went into this um, you know, invention that has so changed our lives. And so I do think it is important as we study uh, website development to take a moment to understand some of the technology that went into the development of computers and also to understand precisely why uh, computers developed at the pace they did. It's amazing um, more has happened in computer development in the last 10 to 15 years than occurred in the previous 50 years. And a lot of that has been because of the rise of our consumer culture. So, you know, when we're studying the history of technology, there's kind of two different schools of thought usually. There's a group of people who are more technological determinist who pretty much think that technology largely is the product of scientific innovation, uh, personal and individual genius, research, and things like that. So those histories usually tend to focus on individuals, companies, um, technological tools, and so forth. And I certainly there's a good deal of merit to that. I mean, a lot of these are the products of of technological geniuses basically. I mean it takes a lot of innovation to make this take place. But then there's others who are more interested in the social and cultural aspects of technology and believe that technology doesn't isn't created in a vacuum. It basically comes out of and, and spans from um, changes in society. That as society changes it creates an increased increased demand and uh, market for these new technologies to then evolve and develop. Basically, the ideas come from outside the laboratory. So I would say in the history of computing, really what you have is kind of a blend of both. I mean, that's, that's kind of a um, you know, wussy way of uh, de defending that. But I think there's a certain amount of synthesis that is required to really understand the history of computing. So let's talk about the history of computing a little bit. Um, you know, First, talk about World War II. When you talk about uh, computing, it's really important to understand that um, World War II was a major, major period in the development of computers. Um, the world was on the brink of disaster with the rise of Nazi Germany, the expansion of imperialistic Japan. The United States was putting into field the largest army, largest military force that it had ever assembled, millions of soldiers and sailors that were going to have to be able to communicate with one another across the globe. Plus, the United States was fighting really a, a world war, a really truly world war. I mean, during World War I, the United States went overseas and fought in Europe. But in World War II, they're going to be all over the globe. They're going to be in Asia. They're going to be in Southeast Asia, down in the Caribbean. They're going to be everywhere all at once, over in Europe and Africa. And um, that's going to place a major um, demand upon scientific development. A lot of this scientific development is based on two things, communications and the disruption of communications. Because um, many people believe those who could control the communications would ultimately win this war. And then the second thing was on improving weaponry. You know, which side, um, you know, the United States was up against a very formidable enemy during World War II because the Nazi Germany during the 1930s had been the engineering leaders really in the world. I mean, there were lots of engineering developments that had occurred in Nazi Germany during the 30s, including the rise of kind of the, some of the first computers. Uh, there was a Nazi engineer, a German engineer, uh, named Konrad Kruse, K-R-U-S-E, Kruse, who developed a computer in uh, Germany in the late 1930s. And certainly um, the Nazis during the war were able to use scientists like Kruse and um, rocketeers such as Werner von Braun, who eventually come to the United States and helped found the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville. Um, certainly in individuals and engineers like that certainly were interested in computing and ready to make key developments. Um, but I would say, in overall, scientists played a major role in securing an Allied victory during World War II. I mean, scientists really believed at the end of the war that they had played a domineering role, a major role. And uh, most people credit scientists with, with at least, if, if nothing else, trimming at least two to maybe three years off of the war and ultimately possibly saving hundreds of thousands of lives with the scientific developments. Now, the largest scientific project during World War II was by far the Manhattan Project. The United States government sent billions of dollars on the Manhattan Project to develop an atomic weapon, atomic bomb, basically. Um, and all of this was done in intense secrecy. I mean, even the people 
who worked in um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were trying to enrich the uranium, had very little idea what they were doing at all, much less contributing to this uh, weapon that was going to be used against Japan in 1945. Um, the significance of the Manhattan Project is, as it relates to computers, is with the Manhattan Project came a lot of money, and with that became a newfound greater respect for scientists within the federal government. So the federal government started looking for other projects to fund, um, other ways to do this. Plus, with the rise of atomic weapons, also, a scientist realized and the federal government realized the necessity to build better means of communication to help control these weapons and also better computing to help deliver these weapons. How do you get a weapon of this size and magnitude across the globe, especially once rocketeering uh, becomes a part of it, not just delivering as a payload in the um, you know, back of a bomber or something like that. Um, so out of that um, Manhattan Project, really federal funds spiked for research and development for all types of technologies, ranging from weapons to communications to personal hygiene. I mean, there was a lot of money to be had, and scientists, certainly this was like the golden era of uh, federally funded research. I mean, things will change drastically in the 60s and 70s, but during World War II, leaders, including FDR, really firmly believed that scientists could legitimately help the U.S. win the war. And it's not just in the U.S. I mean, over in um, England, Great Britain, scientists are also playing a major role in the outcomes of the war. Um, one prominent, uh, one guy that's usually kind of referred to as the father of computing is a guy named Alan Turing, and that's a picture of Alan Turing right there. Alan Turing was a British scientist. Um, during the 1930s, he had gained a great innovation. He was known really as one of the first computer scientists. Um, he was one of the first person, persons to hypothesize the computer is a machine capable of expanding rather than just duplicating human calculation. Basically saw the computer as a limitless machine in terms of ideas. And um, previous computer scientists largely saw the computer as doing nothing more than saving human beings time and expense in developing their calculations. Turing, however, saw things very differently. He saw it as, as something beyond that can help us reach new heights um, in there. It's not just a replacement for a human being. And so when World War II began, uh, the British basically drafted Turing into the, um, their research um, projects. Uh, one of the most uh, ones that Turing worked with was at Bleckley Park. Bleckley Park was a, it was basically a farm out in the English countryside where scientists congregated and um, were working on different technologies. And it was out in the countryside largely to escape the bombing raids of the Luftwaffe, the uh, Nazi Air Force during the war, kind of keep them safe. Um, and I'll say Turing had a tremendous impact upon the war. Um, the primary goal at Blakely Park was to intercept, decode, and understand German communications. Um, they firmly believed they could understand German communications, communications to the German subs, the U-boats, communications to the German Luftwaffe, that they could predict when Nazi bombers, when Nazi attacks were going to occur, and also they could predict Hitler's next moves, basically. You know, they would understand what was going on, because Hitler was facing the same problem. I mean, Hitler was facing the problem of having to manage a war across several continents, across thousands and thousands of miles of territory, and, you know, frankly, he had just as many difficulties doing that as the United States did. However, though, the Germans did have one um, tool in their, in their kind of playbook, and that was called the Enigma. Enigma basically looked like a, almost like a typewriter, essentially. And what it was, it was a coding machine. Uh, the Germans entered messages into the Enigma. The Enigma performed a series of calculations mechanically, mechanically calculation. This is not a, an electronic machine. It's not a digital machine. It's a mechanical machine. Um, but, it, but it would uh, perform these calculations, and basically it would spit the uh, message back out or produce the message in a code that then would be re relayed to the um, German officers or whoever it was who was supposed to receive the message, and then they would then input that message back in, and it would reinterpret it and tell them exactly what things were supposed to say, basically sending things in a very cryptid and coded manner. Um, the British were desperately trying to intercept these, and Turing helped the uh, British do this. Uh, Turing developed the Bomba machine, uh, B-O-B-E, the Bomba machine, and the Bomba machine successfully intercepted the Enigma, intercepted a variety of German um, encrypted messages. Basically, what happened, they would um, um, intercept these, and uh, the Bomba was set up where it even had a teletype, almost like an early monitor. Imagine a very small, maybe four-inch wide 
a green screen monitor that was like a really hazy, bad early television, basically. That's what the Bomba was. But the Bomba um, was able to decode and break the German codes. And um, this was done for all sorts of things. The Germans used other tools beyond the Enigma. They had other encryption devices um, that transmitted Hitler's mail and all correspondences in and out from Hitler's command. And the joke was at the end of the war that Winston Churchill, through the Bomba and other machines that Turing developed, uh, that Winston Churchill was able to read Hitler's mail before Hitler ever read his own mail. I mean, they were intercepting things so quickly. And um, the Bomba played a major role in planning of D-Day, uh, the planning, of, the plans of D-Day, of where to strike, when to strike, and so forth, were definitely shaped by the messages intercepted by the Bomba. The Bomba understood where, Ger or was able to help the British understand where German troop allocations were, so for so on. I mean, they knew as much as, the, actually the British knew as much as the German field commanders did, uh, because they were directly intercepting uh, Hitler's messages. Also during the war, you start seeing a need for additional computing as well. You start seeing de um, development of direct firing mechanisms, basically automated anti-aircraft guns. Uh, during the war, the British were suffering from German air raids, and then towards the tail end of the war, uh, the Nazis start firing V-2 rockets, you know, which are capable of striking. And they needed some kind of device that could help them track these um, planes and track these missiles in the sky and shoot them down. Uh, the great thing about the V-2, even though it's a very powerful and awe-inspiring weapon, is that it didn't have any kind of manned controls. Um, once it was fired, it pretty much just went to its uh, target. It didn't have an ability to maneuver. And because of that, it flew in a direct line. And if you could get a direct firing mechanism to kind of calculate the speed and the general arc and trajectory of that rocket, you could program any anti-aircraft gun, or at least one with a direct firing mechanism, to track it in the sky and shoot it down. Basically match the speed and distance of the rocket and shoot it down. And so that was a major development during um, World War II. In fact, you know, in many ways, some of the first computers really were anti-aircraft guns uh, that, were, that were built in, for the British. Um, another tool, too, and this was also used to kind of fight, up, fight against the V-2 rocket, was fuse bombs. Um, basically, they, they created a bomb using um, vacuum tubes. Um, vacuum tubes were very kind of stable then. And, and in a minute, I'll show you when the development of vacuum tube occurred. But in reality, what happened is during World War II, a lot of these technologies that suddenly appear in the 1950s or late 1940s were already in development during World War II and widely used during World War II. It's just that they weren't really... Um, they're almost classified top secret information at that point. But a fuse bomb basically could be fired in the air, and it didn't have to directly strike the V-2 bomb. Um, it had a mechanism in it that was able to detect the V-2's um, electromagnetic kind of signal it gave off, basically, as it's being fired and as it's flying through the air. And when it got in a certain proximity of it, it would explode and destroy the V-2, basically you know, destroy it enough to knock it off course and detonated in the sky. Uh, so fuse bombs were very, um, also another major technological uh, innovation during the time. So again, those used um, vacuum tubes, which you know eventually will be used in everything from televisions to radios um, to refrigerators. I mean, almost everything uses a vacuum tube. All right. The early history of computing really is a story of calculation. You know, the earliest computers, their design was intended to help humanity improve its ability to to um, compute complex calculations in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of human labor involved human labor um, and this demand really crescendo during the Gilded Age it's during the Gilded Age that you really start to see more and more scientists start to think about and dedicate themselves to improving calculation methods and if you think about the Gilded Age, the Gilded Age is the rise of, you know, Andrew Carnegie, uh, John Rockefeller, these major corporations. And these corporations hire thousands and thousands of people. They have payrolls to keep up with, uh, complex inventories to keep up with. And just the record keeping alone um, of that required a, a massive labor pool. Uh, that cost, honestly, these companies a lot of money, and they wanted to reduce costs. And one way to reduce costs, just like today, uh, if you're looking for constant themes in the history of computing, one of the big constant themes is 
computers are always meant to save labor costs, you know, to reduce the labor force and increase efficiency because computers are seen as being more efficient than humans at certain things. And this is during the Gilded Age is when this really uh, came about. You know, the scale of business oper operations had increased to such a point that it required extensive record keeping that now required new machines to kind of keep up with that record keeping. So that's how the Gilded Age kind of kind of boomed. And um, during the Gilded Age, the word computers, uh, if you were to do a newspaper search for the, say, in the 1880s and enter the word computers, you might get results. But they're not really talking about the computers like we think of today. Computers during the Gilded Age were actually referred to as people. Uh, and mostly, almost all of them were women. Uh, most of these companies had basically a labor pool of women who worked with calculating data. Basically, if you could imagine an office space, at, um, you know, U.S. Steel, um, you could imagine a space filled with 30 women uh, sitting at a desk working on mechanical uh, mechanical um, calculators, kind of like the one in the screen here, but a little more complex than that. And basically, each one of those had a certain role. And a lot of times what they did is they would break up complex calculations and each one of the 30 would be working on a different part of the calculation and then turn their part into a master calculator, basically a, the director of the computer lab, which tended to be a man, although it always wasn't a man. I mean, sometimes some of the first middle management positions for women in America in the industrial, kind of new industrial setting was as, in, as these calculators, basically as these computers and these computing departments. Um, they anyway turn it in and then that would, they would then process the information from there. Um, but it required a lot of, uh, of labor and required a lot of cost to do this. So they wanted to, to decrease it, basically reduce business costs and increase efficiency. Um, the Gilded Age, though, wasn't the first period, though, in, in history that um, human beings sought to use calculators, sought to use computers to improve calculations. Um, you can go all the way back to the Apicus. I mean, the Apicus basically is a computer. But, you know, I usually don't like to start like that late. Um, let's, let's start... For our own sake, we're going to start in 17th century France, you know, 1600s in France. Um, there was a French inventor, a mathematician, philosopher, the old theologian. I mean, you kind of imagine like a Thomas Jefferson kind of character in France. That's what this guy was. Um, Blas Pascal. Pascal was a, a great um, leader. Um, Pascal is famous because he was the inventor of the first mechanical calculator first mechanical calculator and it's called the Pascaline and that's what you see a picture of here in this shot here the Pascaline had a series of dials on it that you actually used almost like a, a pad that you would use for your little uh, blackberry or whatever a little stick and you stuck the little stick in there and you actually rotated the dials to the fixed positions so that it could um, basically calculate your um, your your equation and it would spit out the numbers up there in the dials the little white dials that are up above that a fairly complex machine there's videos on youtube if you're just curious like how this thing worked uh, there have definitely been people there are whole clubs out there in france and the united states where people build these from scratch just for a hobby you know as a hobby basically the you know, engineering and computer enthusiasts and so forth um, when my brother was at Georgia Tech, he actually built one of these things for a class. I mean, you had to. You had to pick some older technology to rebuild. So, you know, these things are still kind of Now, why, and, you know, again, um, technological determinists might say, well, the Pascaline is just a product of Pascal's um, intelligence and his scientific uh, know-how and so forth. But that's not really true. What really happened was there was a great societal demand for new calculation devices. Uh, in 16th century France, you start seeing the consolidation of power, um, absolutism, uh, the rise of uh, French states, um, you know, the monarchy and so forth. And with that became increased uh, provincial taxes, more and more tax money going into a centralized location. And frankly, the government needed better ways to calculate provincial taxes. And so in many ways, the Pascaline really wasn't designed for modern uh, or, or contemporary scientific use. It was really designed the way it was set up. It was designed to help calculate taxes that were being collected uh, at various provinces in France. Um, there were several of these in, um, built. I mean, these the um, Pascaline's a fairly successful example of an early calculator now one of the frustrating things about this early period in the 16th century though a lot of these calculators were invented independently you see several of them come about but then very mysteriously you know the, these inventions oftentimes weren't shared i mean inventors a hundred years later will still be trying to recreate basically what pascal had already created 
back in the 16, 1600s. So um, there's not always, there's not journals sharing this information. Really, the only way you would have come in contact with this is by if you'd actually seen it working uh, personally. So that's a major problem in the early history of computing. You have a lot of duplication. I mean, the machines are always different, and some of them are better than others. But in general, you know, they're not building off of one another like we are today in computing. I mean, they're almost starting over from scratch each and every time. So that's the Pascaline. Um, another one, example of one of the early calculators is a German uh, engineer, um, a 17th century German engineer and mathematician, a guy named Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz uh, invented the stepped reckoner, and that's what you see uh, uh, on the sign there. And you can tell this one, just like the other one, is a very mechanical device. It has it has pulleys on it. Uh, you have to rotate, um, you know, the, the cranks basically to get the thing to work. You have to manually set the different um, digits on it for the thing. I mean, it's it, these are still very mechanical devices, but relatively speaking, you know, it's it's fairly small. I mean, this thing here, if you were to put it on a standard size, um, say, dining room table. That's about how big the step reckoner uh, was. But again, it was mainly meant to um, serve government bureaucratic offices. So you can imagine yourself, um, this thing was built, there was about 12 of them built, um, going into a German provincial office and entering in there, and you would see one of these step reckoners in the accounting office, basically, wherever they were. Um, the reason the step reckoner is significant is because the step reckoner was the first one to develop kind of a binary arithmetic, you know, ones and zeros, binary arithmetic uh, manner to do calculations. Um, Leibniz also wrote very extensively about binary mathematics. Um, he's really kind of one of the fathers of binary math, binary mathematical equations. And um, subsequent computer uh, developers and so forth will certainly adopt many of those um, binary um, systems, you know, in their future computers. I mean, our computers today are run off a of binary mathematical system, and that, that traces its roots back to Leibniz and his uh, stepped reckoner. So if you have, like, an iPad or something like that, you can trace it back technically to here, um, even though they look obviously very different. Um, let's talk about some others, especially the British. There were British um, engineers who were also interested in calculation. The most prominent of those was Charles Babbage. Babbage was a 19th century British, um, kind of a renaissance man of sorts. I mean, he's interested in a lot of things, but he was mainly an inventor, an engineer. Um, some people refer to him as the father of the computer. Um, it's kind of interesting they refer him to, as that, because in reality what Babbage did is he said a lot of, uh, he wrote a lot of theoretical kind of language or theoretical literature about computing. You know, this is how computers can work. This is the promise of computers in the future. He made some designs for computers, but he actually never completely built a computer himself. Um, one of the great disadvantages of a mechanical computer and especially during this early period is, you know, if you see the photo in front of you, that's one of uh, his machines. That's the difference engine you see standing in front of you. The difference engine alone had something equivalent of 80,000 parts that went into it. And when Babbage was creating, he could certainly draw it on paper and kind of understand how it could work. He even built small sections of it to serve as little tiny models. But in general, the amount of labor and cost it would take for someone to handcraft during this time 80,000 pieces so that then it could be mass reproduced was too uh, cost prohibitive. I mean, nobody was going to fund it. The British government wouldn't fund the project, although they did give Babbage a little bit of funding to explore this, but it would have required, basically today, what you see in front of you, the Charles Babbage, would have required like Manhattan Project type funding in the 19th century to really pull this off. Um, plus, the difference machine that you see in front of you um, had weighed 15 tons. It's a tremendously heavy device. It's all steel, um, steel, copper. Um, also, it's eight feet tall. Eight feet tall, you see the gentleman sitting there next to it. Eight feet tall basically fills up a small room. Um, the difference machine, though, could calculate a series of values. I mean, certainly, you know, there was a lot of promise to it, but it was actually never completed. The one you see in front of you, several years ago, um, some British engineers took it upon themselves to recreate. They took Charles Babbage's drawings and built a difference engine and created it. And again, even with modern engineers doing this, it took years to complete, and it was a very difficult process. It's much easier just to build a computer than it is to build one of these difference engines. Um, 
Another machine that Babbage uh, created was also called the analytical machine. Uh, the analytical machine was important because, again, he didn't actually build the thing. He just made designs for it. But the analytical machine itself could actually use punch cards, punch cards to program it. You know, how do you tell the computer what to do? How do you tell the computer what you wish to, um, to compute? Um, you know, many of the first calculators had a lot of dials that had digits on it and so forth that you had to manually move. Uh, Babbage in the analytical machine planned to use punch cards. You'd punch the cards and make certain digits in the cards that would represent uh, different um, mathematical uh, numbers. You would enter that card into the machine. The machine would read the card and calculate, basically. Um, so that was kind of one of the first to really use the punch cards. Punch cards are going to be really popular. We're going to cover those here in a minute. But, uh, you know, punch cards are very significant. Another significant part of Charles Babbage is this lady, Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace um, was a, um, she didn't actually work directly with Charles Babbage. I mean, it's not like they lived together or saw each other every day. What Ada Babbage did, though, is Ada Babbage learned that um, Babbage was using punch cards to do this. And so uh, Lovelace, um, basically on her own, started developing programs for the analytical, the analytical machine using punch cards. She started developing programs. So in many ways, Ada, Ada Lovelace is really the first computer programmer, uh, you know, computer programmer for the analytical machine. So that's a, you know, kind of a first. The first computer programmer was a female, uh, Ada Lovelace. But again, Babbage basically, it's kind of like your classic mad scientist, almost like the guy in the Back to the Future or something like that. Babbage spent a lot of time making designs. He spent a lot of time talking about his device. He certainly wrote a lot of literature that later computer scientists will certainly use. I mean, that's why people consider him the father of the computer, not because of what he built, because of the ideas. Uh, Alan Turing certainly um, is influenced by Charles Babbage uh, later on. Um, so, you know, that's kind of why Babbage is, Babbage is significant. But in reality, he kind of died almost penniless. I mean, he, um, people who visited his shop after he died um, were just struck by, you know, the mess of it. He had half-completed parts, half-completed machines, and, you know, it's almost like a, a, mad, a state of madness almost for him that he couldn't complete this. He just ran out of time. He invented other things, too. He filed all kinds of patents in his lifetime. Very significant uh, engineer in history is Charles Babbage. Let's talk more about calculation. Um, after Charles Babbage, at the early 20th century, you start seeing some significant changes in um, how these calculators are operated. Uh, the first uh, big introduction is uh, the introduction of punch keys, you know, push buttons to actually operate it. Previously, in order to enter in uh, numerals, you had dials or you used punch cards or whatever it is. Uh, but the first machine to actually use push button, you know, technology, which we still use today in calculators, we still push a button to enter in the numbers, at least most calculators, is the Dalton adding machine. The Dalton adding machine was invented in 1902 uh, by James Dalton. And you see an ad here for the Dalton adding machine. And you can see a person with their hand and, and notice the, um, it's a female hand uh, touching the button there. Again, women were still largely... Uh, the ones doing the computing. They were the computers uh, for that. Um, it also, um, in the little sign there, you probably can't really read it very well, but it also talks about who the customers are for the uh, Dalton adding machine. You know, the U.S. government purchased thousands of these. This was a very successful machine. Uh, Sears Robot Company purchased a lot of these machines. You started seeing the Dalton machine in, in, um, in businesses all across the country. And again, you can look at the machine here, you can tell, you know, the lady can punch in um, the digits, she pulls the crank, punches in another digit, pulls the crank. Um, there are different, um, the red keys basically are a uh, function that tells what to calculate, plus, minus, whatever it may be. And then up at top, they've combined it with basically a typewriter that then prints out uh, what you want. You know, if you've ever used one of those, um, you know, um, handheld calculators that has the printing tape on it that's pretty much a small version of the Dalton adding machine again 1902 so significant things um, another major uh, advance in calculation was the Curta calculator it almost looks like a little uh, fishing reel or something like that but it's basically like the size of a pencil sharpener uh, that's the Curta and the Curta actually you see on the sides of it those are the digits you set those to certain sizes uh, you crank it you reset the numbers, you crank it again, you set it to what equation you want it to do, and boom, it gives you an output, basically. Um, the Curta 
is uh, very significant. It's the first portable handheld calculator, first portable handheld calculator, and that's developed in 1948. And again, if you look at the date there, that's right after World War II. Um, these were being developed during World War II to assist with calculations on the battlefield and also with calculations in naval ships as well, uh, where you wanted to have as small of a device as possible. Um, possibly as well handheld the only problem with the curta was it was very expensive um, the ones you see here would have been well over a thousand dollars at the time and you think about 1948 um, you know that's that's you know, a very expensive machine for the age. Uh, the Curtis did eventually become a little slightly cheaper, but they didn't really catch on, though. Um, the problem with the Curta is most scientists and mathematicians certainly understood how the Curta worked, but as far as the average consumer, it was a little beyond them. So um, one of the great secrets of computing is to make it user-friendly for the uh, consumer, and that's not really going to happen until 1970 in the Casio uh, this is a Casio. Uh, this right here is the first mass-produced, inexpensive calculator right here. And this calculator is about the size of a shoebox. Um, I had one of these, actually. I still have it somewhere back at home, uh, the calculator here. And you see there, you had a little, like, it's a little touchpad, just like an old phone um, and so forth. You had the little operations out to the right-hand side. It was electronic, worked off electricity, had a digital uh, display very poor digital display, not truly digital. It's almost more like the old alarm clocks more than anything else. But it's the first one. It was mass produced in 1970. And the price for these were fairly reasonable. I mean, as each model came out, it kept getting less and less expensive and cost prohibitive. So after the 1970s, you start seeing calculators in every business. You start seeing them on every desk in a business because they could afford them. And also, you start seeing them back at home. Uh, Casio, by the way, is a Japanese company. Uh, this is one of the many Japanese innovations in technology and engineering that occurred during the 70s and 1980s. Uh, you know, Japan kind of su supplanted uh, Germany there for a while in, in engineering developments and so forth. Um, so that's the history of calculation. Again, the, the the calculator is a computer. I mean, it's just a different kind of computer. It's not like our iPads or anything like that, but it certainly performs calculations and uh, certainly provides um, uh, calculations for for humans that humans input. I mean, that's pretty much what a calculator does. Um, one of the major problems with computers early on is, you know, the history of computing largely is a history of the development of various parts of a computer. You know, the parts of the computer kind of had their own timelines, and um, it's really important to understand that computers didn't develop in a straight line trajectory. Sometimes the communications part of a computer kind of lagged behind the more mechanical and electronic parts of a computer. Storage was always a major issue on a computer. How do you store data? How do you read and present data? How do you control the computer? You know, today we use a mouse, we use a keypad, um, we use um, audio instructions, you know, a microphone to con control a computer in many cases. Um, all of those things developed individually over time and it took a while to kind of master that. Well, one of the major, major problems with computers is just storage. You know, we expect to be able to store and retrieve and alter data from our computers. That's basically what the basic function of a computer is. You want to store information there, you want to retrieve information, and you want to be able to alter it, alter it and then restore it. Um, some of that's beginning to change. I mean, cloud computing certainly is changing the way we think about how we store data. But the, even with cloud computing, there's still always going to be a stored data component to computers. I mean, it's just not going to go away, at least not in the short term. Um, the first type of storage, storage or data uh, for a computer were actually punched cards. Punch cards were very big, and actually punch cards were used um, all the way back to the early 1800s, right up to the 1970s. I mean, you still saw punched cards um, there. Um, I remember when I registered for my first class at West Georgia, and you know, it hadn't been that long ago, but I registered using a punched card. <laughs> I went to a desk, and they actually programmed this card by punching certain holes in it that I then took to a machine. It read that, and it printed me out a schedule, basically, at the end of the day, a punch card. Um, so even in the mid-'90s or so, uh, West Georgia, which isn't exactly the model of technological um, advancement, was still using basic punch card technology. So... But the punch cards actually have a long history to them. Uh, the first punch cards were developed in 1801, and they were used in the textile industry. 
uh, the textile industry, uh, you know, this is something cool that would look cool in a quilt museum or something like that. But in the first textile, uh, first use of the punch cards really occurred back in France. Uh, this textile engineer named Joseph Jacquard uh, was the one to kind of create the punch card. Um, and what he did is he created this thing. And what you're seeing in the picture there is a Jacquard loom, a Jacquard loom. And the yellow uh, devices that you see up on the top there right next to the right next to the smoke detector there in that little general area up there, those are punch cards. Um, they're very long. I mean, they were more than a foot wide. But basically, those are punch cards. The holes in there represent bits of data that the machine's going to interpret and use to craft the textile um, in front of it. Um, uh, basically, what Jacquard did with these uh, things is he used these cards to program patterns for the textiles. You know, if they were making like a woven carpet and you wanted to make a really intricate pattern, um, they used punch cards to do that. In fact, um, in some places, uh, carpet industry still use punch cards still today. I, I was touring a carpet factory a couple years ago, and they were still using punch cards, largely because there have been other devices that have replaced it, but in many cases, the devices that replace them, the punch cards are just as efficient. So until your machine breaks, you keep using it pretty much. And it's really interesting to see. I mean, in this textile plant I visited up outside of Calhoun, they were still producing punch cards by the thousands every day to help program their machines. Um, so anyway, he wanted to use this to create complex patterns in textiles and create very standardized patterns. I mean, you could create the same pattern a thousand times over and sell them kind of like a, a mass production of uh, artistry and so forth. Um, here's a photo of uh, Jacquard, not a photo. This is actually a silk weaving of, uh, of Jacquard. And this was actually done using cards. If you look at it very closely, you can kind of see the, the, um, the threads in it and so forth. Uh, 24,000 punch cards were used to create this image of Jacquard in memory, kind of in memory of him and his achievements. But again, that's the kind of thing. That right there was done by punch cards. That was an early innovation there. Meanwhile, in the United States, um, you know, punch cards are really going to start to come into use in the uh, 1890s. Um, the main uh, proponent or the main advocate for uh, punch cards in the U.S. was a man named Herman Hollerith. Herman Hollerith uh, developed punch cards to basically compile data for the 1890 U.S. Census. The U.S. Census in 1890 started collecting more and more additional data. The tools became larger and larger, and the data that came in, they needed a more efficient way to manage and collect that data and interpret the data. And so what um, what Herman Hollerith did is he created a tabulating machine, basically. And that's what you see. There's a picture of a man sitting there at a tab tabulating machine. In front of him are a bunch of dials. They look like old-fashioned alarm clocks. But basically those dials are set for different digits, different spaces. Um, I'm no mathematician or anything like that. But basically through this machine and through the use of punch cards, they were able to take large amounts of data, c c interpret it, combine it, and spit out new data basically for it and actually a lot of these tabulating machines still exist there's one of these in the smithsonian um, i saw one recently when i was in nashville there was a state office in nashville that had one sitting over in the corner and uh, no one in the office really knew much about it but it was a tabulating machine back from the census um, hollowith founded the tabulating machine company tmc uh, the reason the tabulating machine company is important is because eventually the tabulating machine company will become ibm International Business Machine. And IBM, by far, in the whole history of computing, played probably the dominant role of any computing uh, business out there. Um, IBM was the main leader in computing all the way through the early 1980s. Um, it'll eventually get kind of supplanted by Hewlett Packard, Apple, and so forth and so on, and others. But even still today, if you're talking about business machines, you know, machines specifically designed and built for specific business applications, you know, IBM is still a major leader in that field. Um, they're just not a major leader in commercial applications anymore. There's a lot of places that have kind of come and stolen their thunder. But uh, punch cards were basically used from about 1900 to about the 1960s in the United States. And again, you still see random punch cards used all the way into the 90s. It just depends. Um, at their peak during the 1950s, IBM was producing 10 million punch cards a day. 
10 million of them, you know, for that. And a lot of times IBM, that's how IBM really made a lot of its money. IBM made the machines that interpreted the punch cards, but in many cases too, IBM also programmed the punch cards. They're the ones who actually manually created the punch cards. Uh, businesses would tell IBM what they needed. IBM would then program the cards and ship them to the um, company, all of which were a pretty handsome fee. Um, the first computer programs were built using punch cards, though. They were built punch cards. Ada Lovelace, like I said, back with Charles Babbage, used punch cards to build uh, basic programs. Um, punch cards are in existence for a while. Um, they kind of coexist for quite some time in history with the vacuum tube. Um, vacuum tubes are just another invention, another way that um, people are going to use to store data in computers. Um, the first first real vacuum tube was created in 1946. It's called the Williams tube. And actually it's referenced in the Vannevar Bush article that y'all read. And in the article it mentions the tubes and these new wave of the future devices um, that are going to help improve communications. And what he's referring to is a tube that hadn't even been released yet to the public. Uh, vacuum tubes, like I said, were being developed during World War II. They were used during World War II. But in terms of commercial application and um, application in computers, it's really not until after World War II that you see a lot of that. But the first real vacuum tube was called the Williams tube. It was invented in 1946. If you see the tube right here in front of you, it's a fairly big tube. I mean, the tube itself is a good nine inches, um, very hefty, actually pretty heavy uh, tube as well. Uh, the Williams tube is extremely delicate, however, it was really easy to break. It wasn't that reliable. It was just kind of the start of this technology. Um, the important things about the tube, though, and its um, definite advantage over punch cards, is the vacuum tube, especially the Williams tube and then anything after it, represented the first um, version that we have of random access memory. Random RAM, random access memory. Um, basically, data can be retrieved quickly regardless of where it's stored in the device. Wherever the data is stored, whether it's restored at the very tail end of the device, the very front of the device, it doesn't matter. The data is going to be retrieved basically at the same speed uh, that is in there. And that's a big advantage um, of the vacuum tube and over the punch card. And that's going to be an advantage even over the um, magnetic uh, tape that we'll look at here in a second. The magnetic tape's not quite as advanced in RAM um, you know, as these other things are. Um, the Williams tube could store up to uh, 1,024 bits, basically a kilobit, one kilobit. A kilobit's basically like a Word document. Hell, a Word document's more than a kilobit. So that's let you know. And so the computers that had these sometimes would have thousands of these. Some of the computers would use up to 20,000 tubes uh, to store data uh, on them. Uh, scientists, though, however, really didn't like the vacuum tube that much. They thought the vacuum tube was very unreliable. They tended to overheat. They were also very, um, they were big energy consumers. It cost a lot of money to run 20,000 vacuum tubes 24 hours a day. Uh, scientists were really worried that you couldn't shut off a machine that had vacuum tubes. I mean, you can't turn it on and off, on and off. That's better just to leave it on. And they also believed you had to leave it on at kind of the highest of efficiency in order for it to properly work. Um, the only problem with that is by doing so, it costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of electricity. Uh, a single computer that would use 20,000 uh, vacuum tubes it would have a significant electricity bill. Even in the, uh, you know, the 1940s and 50s when electricity is still pennies per kilowatt in the United States, um, you know, to run a machine off of these vacuum tubes could cost you well over $1,000 a month you know, just in electricity. So um, the use of vacuum tubes certainly limited the development of the computer, at least for a while. Um, the, also, the problem with the va vacuum tubes is they're a little bit expensive. There are a lot of production problems with vacuum tubes early on, just kind of getting them standardized so that you can kind of predict how a vacuum tube will perform. They had trouble with that, and they tend to overheat. Although scientists did overcome the overheating problem, they learned that you could run, say, 20,000 vacuum tubes at kind of half power. And by doing so, you prolong the life of all the tubes, and you don't really lose a significant amount of data in doing so. Um, so there certainly were developments uh, in the tubes. And the first major computer that's going to use these vacuum tubes is going to be the ENIAC, and we'll talk about it here a little bit more in a second. But in this photo here, you can see this guy standing against the uh, bay. And basically what those are, those are all tubes. There are thousands and thousands of tubes, giant panels of tubes. And this giant computer, the ENIAC, was the size of a room. 
Um, imagine a classroom in Pafford Hall just packed with a computer. Uh, that would be the ENIAC. Actually, um, our class meets on the second floor. You couldn't even store the ENIAC on the second floor. It weighed too much. It would literally fall through the floor on the, the immense weight of all the steel that that went into a machine like this. A gigantic. Plus, you couldn't store it in a Pafford Hall because... Pafford Hall is too warm for it. It had to be kept in a climate-controlled, very cold room, basically, uh, at all times as well, because, again, they're worried about the tubes overheating uh, constantly there. So just to give you a sense, see, you look at old photographs of computers from the late 1940s, usually what you see is giant banks. of, that. And what those are is each tube is, represents a bit of data, and um, uh, computer scientists would have to know where the data was, and they would replace the tubes, basically. And... In order to program the machine, in order to get it to do a specific function, they realign the tubes in certain configurations to do whatever calculations they needed. So sometimes it would take as long as a day to realign the tubes, to get them in the exact position they needed. Then it would probably take another half a day to do the calculation. And then boom, finally you get the actual output that you're looking at there uh, that you needed. So it's a very cumbersome process and one that right away um, scientists want to improve upon. But again, tubes are widely used in a lot of other industries, and um, that's one of the major reasons they kind of stick around in computers, at least for a while. Eventually, um, the tube will be replaced by the transistor in the 1960s, but we'll talk about transistors here in a little while. But right now, let's talk about some other uh, forms of storage. Another form of storage was the magnetic drum, and that's the magnetic drum right here. It's a monster device, basically. The magnetic drum was widely used in the 50s and 60s, um, much smaller than, say, those big giant banks of uh, tubes that you have, but still a pretty big machine. I mean, the average magnetic tube basically is the size of a full-size bed. I mean, it's a pretty big machine. Um, the machine itself could store up to 10 kilobytes, you know, a whopping 10 kilobytes. is basically maybe three Word documents that it could store, 10 kilobytes. Um, it's a very long, very long drum, basically. Um Actually, what you see here is a much larger version of the magnetic drum that could store more. These little small ones down here, they're the small 16-inch versions. The 16-inch ones would basically store about 10 kilobytes. Um, these right here uh, could store up to about 100 kilobytes. So it just depended on the size of the drum that they used. But these drums spun internally. Inside of them, what's happening is in order to create an environment to store data, you had to store the data in uh, electromagnetic pulses, pretty much, you know, in an electromagnetic field. And to do that, you had to spin these things at 12,500 revolutions per minute. Something that's constantly spinning. And you had to keep it going, too. You had to keep it running uh, to do this. And again, the magnetic drums don't really catch on that much because they're expensive, they take up a lot of space, and it takes a lot of power to run these things um, for any extended period of time. Um, the next innovation is magnetic tape. And magnetic tapes are very dominant. I mean, there are many places still today that use magnetic tape. Uh, I was at Aflac down in Columbus doing a tour maybe two or three years ago. And we went in a room, and they still had banks of mainframes that were running off of magnetic tape. And the reason they were doing that is because the system that they invested in cost them millions of dollars back in the 70s, and it's still functioning pretty well. And they've been able to adapt to that over time, so they just aren't quick to kind of change their whole system. The magnetic tape was widely used uh, between the 1950s through the early 1990s. Like, again, you see some still today here or there. The tapes were metal. Um, inside of them was uh, tape that, metal tape that was 1,200 feet long, 1,200 feet long if you spread it out. Um, you could store about 70 megabytes of memory on one of the tapes. Um, that's a significant improvement over the kilobytes that could be stored on the other tubes and so forth. I mean, in fact, today there are newer tapes that can store a terabyte, you know, on these tapes. So um, they definitely improve. Magnetic tapes, basically, for those of you old enough to remember cassette tapes, a magnetic cassette tape is basically the same thing as the magnetic tape we're, we're seeing here. A magnetic uh, cassette tape, basically per 90 minutes of tape, you know, for the real, stores about 660 kilobytes or so of, of, of data. Um, so, but anyway, these magnetic tapes, it was very common back in the 70s to go into a business 
if you went into their data storage, you would go in the back and there'd be a giant room where the whole back wall would be filled with these machines like the IBM magnetic tape units you see in front of you that were running magnetic tape. And the really interesting thing about magnetic tape, if you ever sit and watch one, there's some great YouTube videos where you can see how they work. They don't work in a, just a constant forward motion. Um, magnetic tape's able to retrieve data anywhere it's stored on the tape, but it doesn't do it through a random access memory. It does it through a more mechanical way. Um, it can fast forward and rewind, fast forward, rewind, stop, all of that to find specific bits of data that's stored somewhere along the tape. Um, it, it remembers that, and that's how it, how it basically functions. So if you're in there, you see them, it's kind of almost like a washing machine kind of going back and forth over time they're not just constantly spinning forward if you see one that's constantly spinning forward for several minutes at a time usually they're dumping data onto that magnetic tape making copies or whatever it is um, I went to the Atlanta Journal Constitution office uh, maybe a year or so ago and they have a back room where they stored all their magnetic tapes that they used for years and years and years and a lot of the original copies of their newspapers, their, their their internal correspondence and so forth, are on those tapes. And in the room they're stored in, it's a giant room. I mean, it's the size of several Pafford classrooms. Of, I would say three or four classrooms. And they store them. And on occasion, they have to retrieve them. Still, I mean, they're they're definitely trying to create some kind of initiative to retrieve them in other ways. But uh, again, magnetic tapes are still fairly useful. You see them using magnetic tapes are still used to some degree in the recording industry. Um, I watched a documentary the other day where the Foo Fighters recorded their um, latest album on magnetic tape, basically. Um, so let's talk about the ENIAC computer um, as we talk about that. And ENIAC is very significant in many ways because of its use of uh, vacuum tubes, its use of magnetic tape, um, all that kind of stuff. It's a very big innovation in computers. Um, ENIAC, short, sure, it's an acronym for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, ENIAC. ENIAC. Now, how did it work? The ENIAC was created in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania. 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the ENIAC had 18,000 vacuum tubes. That's how it stored information and processed information through those 18,000 tubes. Um, it was not a binary system. It used a decimal system of arithmetic. Um, that was one of the problems of ENIAC that kind of slowed it down a little bit. Um, later computers will learn that lesson and adopt more binary systems. Um, the ENIAC could be programmed to solve different problems. It was a very programmable computer. Um, that's a big, big improvement over some of the ones earlier. Um, and th that was achieved by reconfiguring the tubes in different configurations. I showed you that photo a minute ago of the guy standing in front of the bank of tubes. That was the ENIAC. And uh, you could send in a programmer to sit there for hours and realign thousands of tubes to do specific operations. Uh, the problem with the ENIAC, though, was that itself. Well, let me let me talk about the significance, one of the significance. It's the first computer to actually be called a computer. I mean, the word computer, as far as referring to a specific machine and not a person, really comes from the ENIAC. The ENIAC is the main leader in that. So very significant just in the verbiage of computers. Um, that's that's what it is. But ENIAC had many problems, though. Um, one of it was just a cumbersome program. It took a lot of expertise to program it. Also, it used vacuum tubes, which again a lot of companies were very uncomfortable with they just didn't like vacuum tubes if one tube went out um, sometimes it took hours to identify which tube went out and then hours to actually repair the tube or you know replace the tube uh, so and you know and a lot of times there were dire consequences if that tube went out in the middle of a calculation uh, sometimes the whole thing had to be restarted basically so there are a lot of problems with the ENIAC um, so the ENIAC led to more innovations. I mean, the ENIAC's really significant because it's kind of a working computer. It's mostly used, or actually it's almost, almost all used in government installations, the ENIAC. Um, you know, the, the kind of people that would own an ENIAC are mostly defense labs that are getting federal funding. Um, this is the kind of stuff like the early... Um, military. You'd see these at the Pentagon. Um, you're less likely to see them, or you're not going to see them at, say, like Coca-Cola headquarters or something like that yet. But um, the NEX problems inspired computer scientists to start to rethink about how the computer works. Um, they started to rethink about um, uh, basically the what's known as the stored program principle. And I misspelled that. It's not stored. It's stored program principle. And basically what it is is data and the programs themselves need to be stored in a common high-speed memory. 
if you can have the data and the program together in a high speed medium that's going to enable the computer to work at much faster rates and it's also going to enable you to reprogram the computer to meet your needs at a much faster rate as well i mean so um you know that certainly helped um so the ENIAC inspired the development of the univac the uni univac um, that's listed down there. The Univac is significant because that's really the first commercial computer. Univac is really the first one that's sold to commercial businesses. Don't get me wrong, they weren't wildly popular. I mean, there were you know very few numbers sold, but they are used in business. It finally breaks out of just government use, defense funding use, things like that. It's no longer really top secret knowledge to have these commercial computers. And the Univac leads directly to the development of the IBM 701. And the IBM 701, was, I would say that is the first commercially successful computer in the United States. Uh, the IBM sells hundreds and thousands of units of IBM 701 to businesses and corporations all across the United States and in Europe as well. Um, IBS, IBM is very aggressive in expanding uh, where their computers are sold. But for right now, let's go back to talking about um, just, um, you know, one of the problems with the stored program principle is if you're going to store data and programs in the same place, you're going to need a mechanism, a device better uh, than the uh, vacuum tube, basically. And uh, because of that, that's going to lead scientists to start playing around with better methods. And eventually that will lead to the development of the transistor, but we're just not quite there quite yet. But um, let's look at the next uh, form of storage uh, device, the hard disk drive. The hard disk drive uh, was invented by IBM in 1956. And again, this is uh, intended to store uh, large amounts of data uh, for for companies and so forth. Um, the IBM Model 350, the one that's kind of modeled here, the 350 is as big as, a say, a dual refrigerator. <laughs> if you have a dual door refrigerator with a uh, freezer refrigerator and freezer unit in it, that's the size of this IBM 350. The IBM 350 could hold up to 5 megabytes of storage, 5 megabytes. Um, these things were extremely expensive, though. I mean, only the biggest of corporations could fund and support the, the purchase of these. Uh, government entities, the Pentagon, stuff like that. But out in the real business world, I mean, you're talking about major corporations, AT&T, you know, things like that. They're buying these things. Even up to 1980, uh, the hard disk drive is still being used. I mean, hard disk drive is really what we use today uh, to store most of our documents. You carry around a flash drive. Flash drive is basically a... a uh, it's um, an ancestor. Its ancestor is uh, the the uh, hard disk drive. In 1980, a hard disk drive. Let's say if you wanted a one gigabyte drive, you know, today you can carry around a gigabyte. And I've got a little SD card in front of me that's 16 gigabytes. It's the size of a thumbnail. Back then, a one gigabyte drive weighed 550 pounds in 1980, and it cost 142 thousand dollars to buy. So that's a tremendous cost, and it really prohibited uh, the development of that. And again, this um, the expense of memory and expense of storage is really holding back computing all the way up through the early 1990s or so. I mean, it still stays relatively expensive. Um, the good thing about hard disk drives, though, they do have RAM, random access memory. It's capable of finding data at various points stored within it and retrieving it. doesn't have to retrieve it in the order in which it was saved, in the order in which it was stored. Um, basically, if you were to break open a hard disk drive, you'd see rapidly rotating disks coated with magnetic material. Um, if you want to see one, go out and look at your electric meter. Um, in your, if they still have electric meters, I know some of them have gone all digital. But if you still have one of those old electric meters on the side of your house with a spinning disc, um, that is basically a hard disk drive. It's a disk material that's coated with magnetic material that basically reads electrical um, input going into your house and reports it back to the you know, meter person who comes and checks your meter. Um, but that's basically a hard disk drive out there. Um, today, you know, these things weigh less than a couple of ounces, and you can buy a terabyte worth of storage now for less than a hundred dollars. You know, significant, and that's changed a good bit. I I still have the first flash drive I ever bought. The first flash drive I bought was in 19. Um, let's see, when did I start teaching? No, actually, it was in 2005 when I started teaching. I bought a flash drive with 320 megabytes of space on it, 
and I still have the receipt for it. It cost me $95 for 320 megabytes. Uh, today, I can buy that same flash drive for like $4. <laughs> so, you know, things have rapidly increased. And what it does is as that increases, as storage sizes become much more smaller, it allows for other components of the computer to become larger. It allows for computers themselves to become smaller. You know, basically allows for things like handheld devices to operate and function, um, you know, well. Um, We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the floppy disk. The floppy disk also had a very long and very successfully, commercially successful um, history in um, computing. Um, floppy disks, you know, were very successful because they were very portable. Um, IBM developed the floppy disk in the mid 1970s. Um, this IBM device that did that again. IBM, we could talk all day about the various innovations of IBM. Um, one problem with IBM is IBM, IBM was kind of like the Apple of of, of yesteryear. Um, always kind of thinking ahead, thinking about how to make things more consumer based, more commercially successful, and more user friendly. All of that. So they came up with a lot of great innovations. The only problem was in about the early '90s, IBM came very stagnant, um, largely because they were a trillion dollar a year company. Uh, you know, all companies at a certain point after they gained so much success kind of stop being as innovative as they once were. And you see that even with Apple. Apple goes through phases where you know, the new iPhone isn't as good as the, you know, as it's said to be, largely because, again, it's really hard to continually be the leading innovator in any kind of field. But IBM, certainly for a large period of time, was seen as the great innovator in computing. And the floppy disks are an example of that. Floppy disks came in various sizes. I mean, it started out as an 8-inch floppy, then a 5 and a quarter. Uh, the ones you see in front of you there are 5 and a quarter. Um, those are the first ones. I remember. And then 3 and a half. And 3 and a half were, you know, those were largely what was used up until the point that uh, USB drives became popular and flash drives to store data became popular. Um, these could hold up to a few megabytes in memory. Uh, the great advantage of floppy disks, they were cheap, convenient, highly portable, and very reliable. Very reliable. You know, the data on there was very secure and could be stored uh, as long as you didn't expose it to magnetic you know, properties or something like that. They were very wildly. And you can still today, um, I have at home an old Texas Instruments computer that will play an 8-inch floppy. And I have a, basically the ver equivalent of Pong on that 8-inch floppy, an old video game. You can put that in and still play it on the green DOS screen that came with that old Texas Instruments computer uh, back in the day. So the data is still fairly secure. I would say the data on those are more secure than the data we burn on, say, a DVD or a CD. Uh, that data actually has kind of a lifespan to it that these um, don't really possess. Um, I've already mentioned this already, but I just wanted to make sure we talk about it a little bit because it's a very important principle, a very important concept in the history of computing, and that is the stored program principle. Uh, the stored program principle was developed in 1945 by John von Neumann. John von Neumann. And basically, again, the stored program principle is you need to store program and data in a common high-speed memory. Um, if you can achieve that, you can make computers smaller, more efficient, more programmable. Basically, if you want to know what the modern basis of computing is, it's the stored program principle. I mean, that what enables us to do the things we do on computers today is because of the adherence and the development and the maturation of this uh, principle. Um, you know, by this, programs could be executed at electronic speeds, you know, highly fast speeds. Programs could be altered as if it was data. You know, as easy as it is to save a file, it's just as easy to change the program that interprets the file. Um, you can see that HTML, for example, the other night in class when I'm showing you how to alter HTML code, that's all stored program principle stuff in action right there. You know, with the click of a button, you can change the appearance of a screen from red to blue um, just as fast as you can save it. I mean, HTML, when you go and save the file, if you save it on the server, it automatically changes whatever it is you're looking at. So, you know, stored program principle is kind of that in operation. Um, the significance of the stored program principle is that it really set the tone that programs, computers would be something that would be programmed internally. You know, up until the stored program principle, a lot of computers were programmed, even to the 50s and 60s, they were programmed by adding different devices to them. You'd have a core machine, and then when you wanted a certain function, you would attach something to the computer to help you achieve that function. And so you carried around bits of computers in your office that each 
served a different calculating or different business function, whatever it may be. But you constantly had to input those, take them out, input them, take them out. It, it was a major hassle and it's very expensive to do. And um, basically with the store program principle, they're going to do that all within one hard drive, basically one drive. So, you know, that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, it's going to take years for this to develop, but this uh, John von Neumann's um, ideas become kind of the foundation of modern computing. I mean, all modern computers are based upon this central idea. Again, cloud computing is changing this a little bit, but, you know, again, it's not going to go away completely. Um, I mentioned earlier that the vacuum tubes were eventually replaced by transistors, and transistors really are the kind of the most important or one of the most important developments in the history of computers. The first transistors were developed by Bell Labs in 1947. Um, they weren't instantly used in computers right away, but certainly there were experiments to do so, and by the 1950s you do start seeing them in computers. Um, Actually, the inventors of the transistor won the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. I mean, it's a very widely recognized uh, tool. Um, initially, the um, transistor was built out of, created out of an element, germanium, uh, 1947 germanium, but eventually they start using silicon. Silicon is more difficult to work with, it's more expensive, but it's more durable, and ultimately it's more malleable. It's much more easier to... Um, to develop circuits and uh, paths in uh, the silicon than it is in germanium. So silicon is what we use today. Silicon, and that's the term, Silicon Valley, uh, which is a major computing and engineering center in California, largely comes from that name, silicon. Um, IBM starts selling transistorized computers in the mid-1950s. The IBM 1401 is the first computer that has a transistor in it. And that's sold in the early 1950s. Again, no tubes. Um, why transistors? Why did the transistor develop? The transistor developed largely because of, not because of consumer demand. Consumers really weren't using computers yet. But it largely became because of military demand. The United States government disliked the vacuum tubes. They did not want vacuum tubes used. And they really urged other developments. And through those uh, explorations, you came up with transistors. Um the significance of that is, you know, the electric circuits, the electronic circuits that a computer uses to actually power itself and run itself are going to be the same circuits you're going to use to store data, to process information, and also to program the computer. It's all going to be in one circuit, basically. And what it did, too, is transistors, over time, get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they start out like the size of an apple, and today they're, they're you know, like molecules, basically. They're very tiny um, you know, these transistors. Um, also, what you start seeing is the development of integrated circuits, especially with silicon, you see integrated circuits, where you can place multiple transistors, you know, millions of them, uh, on a single silicon chip, you know, an integrated circuit. And um, basically, the value of the integrated circuit is it creates almost infinite possibilities for the processing speed and storage capacity of computers. I mean, why can you store 16 gigs on a much small little SD card. Um, it's because of the, the um, silicon uh, transistor that it uses to store information, and that's why. So, so you know, major development. We wouldn't have the computing uh, that we have today you know, without the transistor. Let's talk about mainframes. Um, there's a period of computing history that's called the mainframe era. That lasts largely from 1950 to 1970, 